Morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar for in, uh, Inventor mo Part Modeling. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, so yeah, we're going to be starting this series over the next few weeks and months, um, going over some of the Inventor and a few other tool sets, um, and just kind of giving you guys a an overview of um, the, the design process and, and how we can use the, the products to get the best out of our designs. Um, so, yeah, a little bit about myself. My name is Cameron McKenzie. I'm an applications engineer here at Man and Machine, um, and I'll be taking guys through most of, if not all, of the uh, the webinars uh, over the next few uh, episodes or over the series itself. Um, without further ado, we're going to step straight into Inventor um, and just go over some of the, the design processes that are available for part modeling. So I'm just going to open up inventor quickly on screen here. Yeah. Just hope that everybody can see that. Okay, yeah, looks fine. Cool. Um, so essentially what we got um, when we open up inventors, we've got our home screen here, we've got a few uh, part types or sorry, file types rather um, that we can use. And today we're just going to look at the part modeling side of things. So if I just open up a new part from inside of inventor, this is the home screen that we have here. And just by clicking on part inside of the home screen, uh, we'll essentially be opening up a template for our parts themselves. Um, the first thing we want, we'll notice is um, right at the top of our screen, we've got a ribbon. Those of you that are familiar with, with some other products as well, you'll be familiar with how the ribbons work. Uh, ribbons are essentially broken down into individual tabs. Um, and each of these tabs are made up of panels, and this is how we organize the tools inside of Inventor. Uh, so just so you're familiar with it, um, we've got a 3D model tab for the Inventor parts files. Um, we've also got a sketch and annotate, inspect, and a few other tabs that we can use um, where all of our tools are essentially located. Uh, again, inside of each of these tabs will be individual panels uh, we've got a sketch panel, we've got a primitive panel, we've got a create panel, and so forth. What we've also got down the, the side, on the left-hand side by default, but you might have it moved around, um, is a model browser. Uh, inside of our model browser will be all of the details of our part itself that we've created. Uh, these will include all of the features, all of the, um, the standard um, setup of our part will all be listed inside here. And the features will all exist in a chronological order. Um, we'll take a closer look at that as we add more features onto our part. Essentially what we've got though, um, the main area we'll be working in is inside of the workspace. So it'll be this um, gray area here uh, in the main window. And this is where we will be designing our parts uh, and assemblies and, and later on drawings as well. Now, because Inventor is a 3D modeling software, um, we obviously are able to create 3D models, but to start that off, what Inventor needs is some 2D geometry just to make sense of the 3D part that we want to create. In order to do this, what we'll need to do is we'll need to start off with a 2D sketch. So the first tool inside of the 3D model tab is the 2D sketch or start 2D sketch. So to start this, um, we can literally just click on there, or if I hover over here, you'll see the shortcut for that is S. So if I tap S, we'll be able to start a 2D sketch. We'll then be asked to um, place our 2D sketch on one of the three planes that exist inside of all templates for um, inventor parts. Um, and this will be our XZ, our YZ, and our XY plane. For this demonstration, I'm just gonna use the XY plane. And essentially this will associate the sketch to this plane. Um, what you'll have noticed is, or if you haven't, you'll notice that the view cube itself in the top right, which shows our alignment to the part, will now align to the front of the part itself. Uh, we'll have a look at how that works in a few minutes as well. But essentially we want to have a look inside of the, the sketch environment. And you'll notice as well that um, the sketch tab has now highlighted blue and it's automatically switched us to the tab itself. We can access all of the other ones whilst in here, but the, the sketch tab has, has activated by default and therefore it's a contextual tab. 
knowing inventor knows that while we are in the sketch environment while we're sketching we'll want to use the tools that are inside of the sketch tab so some of the tools that are available to us uh, we've got some some standard ones we've got lines we've got arcs we've got circles we've got some rectangles and a few others that we can use uh, we're just going to start off with the line tool I'm just going to start off um, just to the to the right over here. What you'll notice as well, as I move my cursor around, uh, the coordinates of the positioning will highlight inside here as well. So we've got an origin point. If I hover over that, it, it snaps to the origin point itself, and that turns green. And you can see the, the coordinates or the, the measurement from there, 0, 0 in the X and Y. And that's because we're on the X, Y plane. If we were on the XZ plane, it would show the X and Z value. Um, essentially, all we need to do from here is to click down to start our line. So we can click off just to the side somewhere, and that'll place the first point of our line. What you'll then notice is inside of our, our two windows over here, we've got the measurement, so the length of the line, and we've got the angle of the line. I'm just going to go off at zero degrees, so along the x axis. And what you'll notice is we've got a little glyph that appears next to the cursor, next to the pointer there. Um, and that's essentially going to be applying a horizontal constraint to my line. I'll show you how the constraints work in, in a few seconds, but just be aware of that as I place this line down. Essentially, what that's going to be doing is it's going to ensure that that line stays horizontal at all times. So no matter what happens to my line, if it changes dimensions, if it changes um, heights, that line will always remain horizontal. Similar thing appears when I go directly up from that line. If I go perpendicular to that line, I get another glyph that appears. And you can see that one indicated again to the bottom right of my cursor there. And that's the perpendicular constraint. So that means that whatever happens again to these two lines, these two lines will always remain perpendicular to each other. So always at 90 degrees. And I can come in and carry on placing lines either again perpendicular to each other, or if I hover over the line down at the bottom, the first line that I created horizontally, and move up to a similar position, what you'll notice is I get another constraint associated to that. And this time, this is the parallel constraint. So that will ensure that the line that I'm creating now will always remain parallel to the one below. So no matter what angle they change again, um, those two will always be parallel to each other. Now, this one is locked to a horizontal constraint, and that's fine. But if that horizontal constraint wasn't there and it was at a slightly different angle, we'd have the same effect. Those two lines would always be parallel to each other. So I can finish this off a bit. Um, so I'm just going to go up slightly. Again, just putting in a perpendicular constraint, another perpendicular constraint. And this time I want the, my line to line up with the start point that I created at the beginning. So that point down there. What you also probably noticed by now is I'm not being too accurate just yet with my measurements. I'm just going and placing these lines in. I'm not going to worry too much about the measurements just yet. I just want to eyeball my positioning and the shape of my, my profile, essentially. So just want to make sure that the lines are more or less equal to each other. I can come in and maybe adjust the spacing if I know more or less the, um, the profile that I want, the, the shape that I want is my final, um, my final profile. Once I'm happy with that, if I wanted to add any more detailing, I could. Um, I can come in and add some further lines if I wanted to. So I'm just going to add a line in here. And I'm going to make sure that this particular line is associated to this vertical line over here. So what I can do is I can just hover over that line itself, click down and go off to the side. Again, I'm just gonna make this a perpendicular constraint or horizontal, I'm just seeing which one's behind the glyph. It's probably gonna be perpendicular. Yeah, perfect. You can see that also indicated it on the line um, just to the bottom over there. If I go off to the side, go around back down and across, you can see those line, those constraints are assigned. If we wanted to investigate those constraints, you could just by selecting a line and you can see which ones are associated to the line itself. 
as well as which lines or geometry they're associated to as well. So if I hover over that one, you can see it's it's highlighting both of the lines that are considered part of the constraint itself. If I had to do the same with the line at the bottom over here, with that parallel one, you can see the ones that are considered part of the constraint are then highlighted. And that's how we can investigate these. So essentially I've got more or less the shape that I'm wanting to create from here. All that's left now is to start defining the size that I actually want for this with Inventor being a, a parametric um, product, a parametric modeling software. We want to assign um, the, the correct values to, to the sizes of our parts themselves. So what I can do is I can add in a dimension either inside of the constraint or constrain panel. I can select dimension. Or if I hover over this one again, you can see it. the shortcut is D. So I'm going to tap D, and that will start my dimension tool. Now, because we've eyeballed it, we haven't really got the, the right sizes just yet. We're not going to worry too much about that, because as soon as we define our first size, so if I had to pick, let's just see which one I want to pick. I'm just going to pick the thickness of the bottom over here. I'm just going to bring this off to the side. Currently, that's at 3.56 millimeters. If I know that I want this to be a minimum of five millimeters, I can type in five into the dimension over here. And what that will do is that'll then change the length of that particular line that I've dimensioned. But because this is the first dimension that I'm creating, um, it'll also scale the rest of my part or my, the rest of my sketch up. Um, as, as it needs to, to match that. Um, so essentially, once you've got the, the basic profile, basic outline, you can drive it all with your first dimension. So if I hit enter now, you'll notice then that the rest of the profile um, essentially scales to match what that particular line will need. I can then come in and add some further dimensions in as well. So I've got the thickness down at the bottom there. Maybe I want to define um, the edge over here as to how wide I want that to be. I'm going to make that 20 mil. Um, I'm then going to set the overall height of my part. I'm going to set that to 25. And maybe that is set as well. So you can see essentially what that's going to be doing is because the, the thickness at the bottom here is five, and the total height is 25, that will then ensure that this line over here is 20. So I don't need to dimension that. Um, all that I need to really do after that is set the thickness at the top over here. I could come in and set this as a different thickness to the one at the bottom, but just for the sake of demonstration, I can also reference the other dimension. So I can come in and say whatever thickness at the top whatever the thickness at the, or in this case, whatever the thickness at the bottom is, I want it to be the thickness at the top as well. So I'm just gonna pick that value, hit enter, and then those two will always be um, joined essentially. So if I do, for example, come in and change the value inside here, so maybe something like six, I'm not gonna go too drastic with this. Notice the other one changes as well. Awesome, so um, that's more or less the shape that we want. Um, for this particular one, I'm gonna have the shape revolve around the center point of my sketch itself. And that's why I've kind of drawn it off to the side. Um, what we also want to do is make sure that it's um, aligned correctly to the, to the center point itself. So we'll do that by adding a few extra bits of geometry in. Um, if this was just gonna be a normal extrusion, we wouldn't do this, but just for the sake of the revolve, I'm just gonna show you this process as well. And hopefully this helps you in, in your design process. So to create a center line, um, essentially what we can do is we can start the line tool down here at the bottom um, and we can select the origin point. So just make sure that it's set right at the origin over there. I'm just gonna bring the line up um, directly up vertically. What we can then do is we can select the line itself and choose the center line option inside of format. And that will then turn this line into a center line. Now for the sake of the sketch itself, this isn't too relevant. You could just have a line um, and have it visible as a center line. Um, so it's, it's as well as it's converting it aesthetically to a center line, 
uh, what, where this will be very important later on is Inventor will automatically pick that up as a center line and use that in the geometry creation later on, as opposed to if it was just a normal line, we, we would have to select that manually. Um, but I'll show you that in a few seconds as well. Uh, the only thing we need to do that's left essentially from here is to create a further dimension, just assigning um, essentially the, the distance that we want from the center line uh, to the inside diameter of the part, essentially. And to do that, we can come in and add another dimension. And we can choose the center line. And we can choose the line we want to reference. Now, notice instead of just giving us a dimension between those two lines, because Inventor knows that this is a center line, it's going to automatically place down a diameter rather than a radius or rather than just the, di the dimension between the two lines. So that then it adds a bit more um, to our ability to control this instead of trying to guess or, or calculate it, we can essentially just give it the diameter that we want. In this case, I'm going to go up to or down to 10. You can see that that's now placed that um, dimension to there. So all now we can have a look and, and if we wanted to toggle or, or drag our part around, you can see that in most places it can't move around, it can maybe move up and down, but other than that, it, it looks pretty much constrained based on the dimensions that we've given it. Um, and that's essentially what Inventor wants. It wants us to create a model uh, that is completely dimensioned. Um, if I move this one around over here, you can see that this particular part uh, or this particular section isn't. So I'm just going to add some dimensioning to that. I'm not going to spend too much time on this just for the sake of the demonstration again. Um, but essentially, you can see these aren't going to move around other than up and down. So I'm just going to add some further dimensions to that. And you can see down at the bottom, it's telling us that we need two dimensions. So the two dimensions that it's going to need um, is it the vertical placement of this particular part and probably the length of the center line. Um, so for that, I'm just going to add a dimension quickly to the center line and just say it needs to be 30. And we only need one more dimension. And we're just going to apply that same horizontal constraint that we used earlier, except we're going to apply it between the center point of our drawing and just the bottom right corner or the bottom left corner of our part. And now you can see our, our sketch itself is fully constrained. Uh, so from here, we can just hit finish sketch. And now our sketch has been created and it's fully constrained. So therefore, it's not going to break if we make any changes to any of the, uh, the features themselves. What we can do now with the 3D modeling side of things is we can take that 2D sketch and make it into a 3D part. So we could either come in and create an extrusion of that profile. And to do so, we can just select the profile itself. And then we can tell Inventor how, how long we want that extrusion to be. So we can either use the arrows over here and eyeball it, or we can type in a value. We can make it 20, we can make it 10, we can make it 15. By default, because we're working in a metric part, this will be an, a little be 15 millimeters. But if we wanted to overwrite this, we could say, actually, we want this to be 10 inches. And it will create this as 10 inches. So you can use mixed values if you wanted to as well. Otherwise, if you just type in the value, it'll default to whichever units your document is saved as. So we're going to put that, we can put that as 15. Um, we could also have this go in the opposite direction. We could have the symmetric about the profile, or we could have this asymmetric so we can control the value on either side of the sketch. So you've got the ability to do both in this. For this particular one, as I said earlier, we're going to do a revolve. So I'm just going to cancel out of this and use the same step, basically. Um, so inside of our create panel, we've got the revolve tool. This is the shortcut for that is R. So if I add R, It'll take us into the re revolution tool or the revolve tool. Um, and that needs a profile, which is the same as the extrusion. And what you'll notice is as soon as I click on that, it should pick up. There we go. If I click on axes, it automatically picks up that center line that we've placed down. Um, you could come in and select any other center line if you wanted to. So say, for example, I want to use uh, this edge over here. I could use that. Um, but because we've set that as a center line, 
um, inside of the sketch, it's automatically going to pick up that, that axis for us. And again, we've got those same options. We can either go in the default direction, we can go in the opposite direction, or we can go symmetrically around the, um, the profile itself. And we don't have to go 360 degrees around, we can go 180 degrees around instead. You can see either default direction, flip direction, or symmetrically. We could also do asymmetrically, um, and we can adjust each angle as it needs to around from that original profile. In this case, I'm just going to go in the default direction and 360 degrees around and hit OK. Now, it hasn't picked up that little notch that I wanted inside there, and that's fine. What we can do is we can just ensure that we pick that as part of the revolution itself. So if I right click on here and say edit feature, we can come in a little closer and deselect that by holding shift, that region. And it's now going to add that to our, our profile itself or onto our part itself. So that's creating the, the primary feature itself. Um, so that's all, all great for, for doing that. Um, but obviously, that's not going to be our, our finished product. We want to add a bit more detailing to the, the product uh, before it goes off to manufacturing. And to do so, we can, cut, we can add some secondary and um, even tertiary um, features essentially to our part itself. So as I said earlier, we've got the model tree over here. It's got the revolution in there. We want to add further features on top of that. To do so, we can come into the modify panel and we can start to add some um, preset features on here. We could add in a fillet. And to add a fillet, we then just need to select the edges that we want to apply a fillet to. So I'm going to select these two edges over here. That might be a little bit too big. So I can use the arrow again to drag that a little smaller, or I could type in the value as well. So if I want this 0.3 millimeters or 0.4 millimeters, oh, I had too many points there, we can come in and type the value in. Otherwise, we could again just eyeball it. We can also come in and add some chamfers if we wanted to. So inside of the modify panel, we've got the chamfer tool. We can add that in as well. Um, again, we can use the arrow to adjust this. We can type in the value here. This will be a distance from the edge to the start of the chamfer. Otherwise, we could also use a distance and an angle. With the distance and angle, it'll need a face to apply the, the chamfer itself to and an edge to apply this to as well. From there, we can drive the distance of the chamfer and the angle of the chamfer again using the arrows or inside of the box using the, dis the distance and angle dialog inside here. As soon as I OK that or apply that, we can then close that off. And we've got that chamfer added to the, to the top there. Quite a, quite a very narrow chamfer there, but that's fine for this. We've also got the ability to add in holes if we wanted to. So I'm just going to add some holes to the top surface over here. Um, and with the hole tool, we've got quite a lot of options available to us. So to place it down, essentially it just needs a face that we want to place this to. So it's important that you select obviously the, the correct face for this, and it'll need a flat face essentially for this, whether it be a face or a plane. So if I had to select that face over there, you can see it's going to be positioning that hole directly on the face. And again, we've got a few options available to us. So we start off with a simple hole, and that's essentially just a hole um, with an extrusion. So it's a diameter and a depth, essentially. So we can either come in and set a distance, or we can say we want this to go through all, and all that's required is a diameter for the hole itself. We've also got the ability to add some seats to it. So whether we add a counter ball, all we need to do for the counter ball then is add a diameter for the counter ball or a depth for the counter ball. And again, we've got the arrows and geometry on screen. So we could all eyeball this as well by adjusting the diameter of the counter ball, adjusting the diameter of the hole. And we could even adjust the depth of both. So the counter ball and the hole itself. We've also got similar options for spot face 
and for countersink. And then the other hold types that we've got. So we've got a simple hold here, which doesn't require much other than a, uh, a diameter. Um, we've also got the ability of adding in a clearance hole, and this will pick up based on various standards. So we can come look through the standards over here, whether it be ANSI, whether it be DIN, whether it be ISO, and we can pick from some of the standard hole sizes from here. So we've got at the moment an M1.6. Uh, we could bump this up to an M5 if we needed to. And you can see we've got different fit options. We've got close, we've got normal, and we've got loose. We've also got the exact same seat options, so they can be counterball, spot face, and counter sink. The other options we've got is tapped, so this will add a thread to our hole. We can add a thread depth, whether it goes the full depth or not. We can choose the direction of the thread. And we're going to again choose the size. So because this has standard sizes available, we can choose them from a type list. So we've got ANSI, ISO, DIN, got some GB metric profiles that we can pick from. And we've got the sizes that we can pick from again. So again, I'm just going to go four or five. And then we've also got a tapered tapped hole, which again, similar to the tapered hole, except this one will be uh, sorry, similar to the tapped hole, but then this one will have a taper to it, and we can set the taper angle and all of that as well. And again, we're picking up from different standards. So various options that we've got available to us. I'm just going to go for a tapped hole. Uh, I'll go for an M5. And um, essentially, all that's required from here is to hit OK once you're happy with that, and we'll then place the hole on the face itself. If you wanted to adjust the positioning of this hole, what you'll notice is inside of the hole itself, the makeup of it. So if I expand the whole um, feature inside of my model browser, I've got a sketch that's essentially driving the positioning of that hole. So I can come into the sketch here, double click to edit it or right click edit. Um, and you can see we've got a point on the face. This point can move around and that's essentially driving the positioning of our hole itself. So if I wanted to, I could come in here um, and actually drive its positioning from inside here. So I'm going to use a vertical constraint just to make sure that this hole is aligned vertically to the center point. And that'll ensure that it doesn't move from side to side. It can only move up or down. And what I want to do with this one is I want to drive its position um, on that face itself. So I'm going to select the, I'm going to add a dimension between the center point of my sketch or of my part and the point that the hole is associated to. And I'm just going to make sure that this is now 20 mil from the center. Once I hit finish sketch on there, you'll see the position has changed and this will now be driven by that value, by that parameter. I can then also come in and if I don't want the hole only in the one position, instead of going around and, and placing down various points and adding holes to those points, I can also come in and create a pattern of features. So in this case, I'm going to create a circular pattern of that feature, and the feature itself will just be the hole. So if I come in and select circular patterns over here, I can come in and select the feature. And I can also select a axis in which I want to revolve this around. So similar to the revolve tool, we're going to use a a axis to revolve this pattern around. So I'm just going to use any of the geometry that that's, will have this, the right center point, because it's going to revolve this around the center point of the geometry. So I'm going to, se going to select the inside face of that part over there. And you can see how we've got that available to us. We could also use the axes as well, um, The in this case, the y axis. But um, just for the sake of this demonstration, we're just going to use the inside face. Once we've got, once we're happy with that selection, we can come in and drive the number of items that are created or the, the quantity of, of features that are patterned essentially or, or, or created. Um, so we could drive this up and make eight of them. And you can see the preview inside of our window, um, or we could drop this down to four, for example. And again, we could set the angle. So if we wanted to drop this down to only go 180 degrees around, it'll still create four of these. Um, 
but only go 180 degrees around. That's the center point of our pattern. Uh, we can flip this direction as well. Or we could change the value to something like 270 degrees. And that gives pretty much a similar value. If we go 360 degrees, it's clever enough to know that it'll be placing the last one on top of where the, the hole is currently. So therefore, it's going to distribute them evenly across the entire pattern. Once you're happy with that, you can hit OK. And you'll see that we've got another feature that's been added to our model tree here. Because the, this pattern itself is referencing our original hole, anything we change on the original hole will then change for all of the other holes. So if we had to come in and edit this hole, if we select it, right click and select edit feature, we can come in and actually edit the hole itself. So maybe instead of an M5, we want to pick this up to an M8, maybe a little bigger, maybe an M10. We can hit OK. And once we've changed the one, because the others are in the pattern, all of the other ones then change as well. So anything we change on the one will change in the other. Um, speaking of changing, we can also change if we wanted to the profile that we originally created for this. So if we had to expand out our revolution or our revolve, we can see we've got our first sketch that we created. And that's inside, it's been consumed by that profile, by that revolve. So if I right click on the sketch and select edit sketch, we could come in at any point and change this as well. This has changed its orientation. So if I just rotate that around quickly, we could come in at any point and maybe even change the diameter of the, the inner diameter. So if I bump this up to something like 15, we can do that. We can also change the, the, the width of that face, maybe to something like 25. Once you're happy with that, we can hit finish sketch. And that will then update our part. So by update, by changing the sketch at any point, you can actually update your part as well. One thing to be aware of that would be the, the, the holes themselves are dimensioned to the center point of the part itself rather than the edge. So you want to essentially come in and, and adjust the, um, the dimension from the edge over here of the part itself. So we can do that inside of the original hole. Uh, if I come in and change the sketch, right click edit sketch, I can delete this dimension. I can also then project existing geometry onto my current sketch. So I'm going to take this face over here or even just that edge. And that edge is now going to be projected onto my sketch. I can then just add a guide to my point. So I'm going to use the circle as a guide. And in a similar way to how we created a center line earlier, we can also create construction geometry. So I'm going to select construction geometry there inside of my format panel. And I'm just going to add a dimension between my construction line and the one I've just projected now. So I can drive the positioning from that hole or from the um, outer diameter of that, that cylinder as well. I'm just going to bump this up to something like maybe eight mil. Hit finish sketch. And again, the pattern will have changed because I've changed the original hole from there. Awesome. So the last thing I want to show you quickly, now that we've got this here, um, we also want to um, be able to calculate uh, the part itself's weight and the change maybe the look of the part as well. Um, to do so, what we can do is first analyze uh, the properties of this particular part. Um, so we can right click on the part inside of the model browser and we can look at its eye properties from inside there. And this will look at the entire part as a whole. There are various other properties we could look at, but just for the sake of time and for this demonstration, I'll just show you in the physical tab, we've got um, the ability to pick up some of the general properties of this part. Some of those will include the volume and the mass, as well as the area of the part itself. So based on 
inventor knowing all of the dimensions of the part and all of the geometry of the part, it can then calculate the volume of your particular part. If I had to hit this update over here, you can see that the volume of the part has now been calculated in here. And based on this part having the material of a, or having the generic material, which is equal to, which has a density that is equal to one gram per cubic centimeter, the mass of this part itself will be 0 0.033 kilograms. If we had to change this, for instance, at any point, so say we want to change this to something like gold instead, notice that the density then changes. And because the density then changes, the weight of or the mass of our part will then have changed as well. So inventors always or continually tracking um, the volume of your part, if it doesn't by default or update the, the values in here, you could always come into the I properties and update that as well. Um, but once it's updating, um, it'll continually give you feedback of that. Um, and that can also calculate your center of gravity um, and a few other inertial properties as well. So a very handy thing to have in here. As soon as I hit apply on here, what you'll notice as well is the appearance of my part changes to match the material. So if I had to go for something like a silver or stainless steel and hit apply, it'll then change the appearance of my part to that. So if I hit close on here, you can see as we rotate our model around, we've got the bit of a shine to it. We can use our, our model, uh, sorry, our view cube over here, not the model browser. Um, and uh, change to different faces to view our, our part from, from the different faces as well. If we wanted to have the appearance of the part change, but still keep the material the same, so therefore we want to have all of the, the values stay the same, but maybe we want to just change the look of our part itself, we can also change that as well. So right at the top of our menu, here we've got our quick access toolbar. We've got the materials to the one side, which is currently stainless steel, and we've got an appearance just next to that. So we can come into this drop down over here and change the appearance to anything we wanted to, whether we wanted to maybe look like titanium, or we just wanted it to have a, a white shade to it. We got the ability to do that, or we could come in and pick any of the other colors. Most of the default colors will also be available in here. And that's essentially um, the design process for, for parts. Um, there are various other tools that we can have a look at later on as well, but the, the basic design principle is to take a 2D sketch, add some detailing to that, use that to create your primary object, and then start to add any extra features, add any secondary or tertiary features to that. I hope this has been beneficial to you. Um, as I said, this is the start of a, of a, of a longer um, series, so feel free to, to um, watch those as well as, as they're released. We'll also be adding these to our, to our YouTube channel, so feel free to, to watch those on there. Um, but yeah, I hope that's been beneficial to you, and uh, have a great day further. Thank you. Bye.